heads up to anybody that has children. I, I called them ahead of time. And, um, and in Jan's case, uh, she has a little girl with her, and I told her ahead of time. But this is about abortion today. It's a timely subject. And some of the stuff was graphic, and that's why I gave a heads up to anybody that has little kids, because I don't know where. I know these two are old enough to know what's going on, but anyway, I titled this, and I, I had a, I struggled to get a title for this, but my wife helped me, and we came up with the term, The Silent Cry. Psalm 139, in verse 13, starts this way, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. David was crediting God with giving him life even before he was born. I praise you in verse 14 because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame, verse 15, was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days and ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Unformed body. That's what the Supreme Court is talking about right now, whether or not an unformed body is a person or a human being. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast the sum of them. And if we all had that attitude, which we once did in this country, we wouldn't be debating some of these things if God's thoughts were precious to us. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I wake, I am still with you. So this week we witnessed arguments before the Supreme Court about challenges to the 15-week rule in Texas. And this video is what second trimester abortions are like. These procedures are what Texas is trying to outlaw. This video is from Dr. Norman McLean, who, it, who was an OBGYN, but at one time did practice abortions. Go ahead, and I want to get the light and we'll... I did uh, practice within obstetrics and gynecology for nearly 40 years. I've done uh, in the area of maybe 8,000 births. That would include maybe 2,000 cesarean sections. I have performed abortions uh, early in my career. Over that time I would have certainly done between one and 200 terminations of pregnancy. So I know about the technique. I am going to describe a second trimester surgical abortion. This procedure is called dilatation and evacuation. It is performed between usually 13 to 14 weeks and 24 weeks of pregnancy. After the patient is given a general anesthetic, the abortionist uses a weighted speculum, one like this, that opens the vagina widely. A late term abortion requires that the surgeon be prepared for one to two days in advance with either drugs or laminaria. Laminaria is a type of sterilized seaweed that absorbs water over 8 to 12 hours and swells to several times its original diameter. Once the laminaria is removed, the cervix will be further dilated using metal dilators, graduated metal dilators. Once the cervix is stretched open, a suction tube is placed inside the womb. This is connected to a suction apparatus similar to a vacuum cleaner but more powerful. The size of a 20-week baby 
is the size of the length of my hand from the head to the rump, not including the feet. The average baby at this gestation will weigh 500 grams. The suction machine will remove from around the baby the pale yellow amniotic fluid that has been surrounding and protecting the baby. Now with babies this big, they won't fit through a suction catheter. The baby's bones and skull are quite strong. They cannot be torn apart by the suction alone. The instrument used to carry out the termination of pregnancy is a forceps a grasping forceps. It is a metal high quality instrument, uh, 13 inches or so in length. The active end of the instrument is about two and a half inches in length and it has teeth within the instrument which when it grasps a structure will not let it go easily. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or a leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the body of the baby. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed, along with other body organs, the intestines, the spine, the heart and the lungs. Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head, because at this stage of pregnancy, the baby's head will be the size of an average plum. It simply won't come through the cervix. In order that this is removed, one needs to crush the skull. This requires inserting the grasping forceps and placing it around the head and crushing the baby's head. That will of course cause damage and injury to the skull bones and one will know that one has achieved that by observing a yellowish creamy fluid moving through the cervix that will be the brains of the baby. The abortionist then removes all of the skull pieces. He then removes the placenta and any other leftovers of the baby with a curette which scrapes the lining of the uterus. The abortionist then will collect the various parts of the body and reassemble them to check that there are two arms, two legs and so on. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the abortion procedure is complete. For the woman, this procedure carries significant significant risks. Major complications can occur, including perforation of the uterus or laceration of the cervix, with possible damage to the bladder, the bowel and other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur and is not rare. These complications can lead to massive hemorrhage, septicemia and include death. Future pregnancies are also a greater risk for loss because of premature delivery due to abortion related trauma and injury to the cervix and uterus. What I have described is an operation that will be done from 14 weeks of pregnancy through to 24 weeks of pregnancy. It's very gruesome. The reality of abortion, particularly the second trimester, is very gruesome. I stopped doing abortions because I realized this is not right. This is not what I should be doing. This is not the medicine, the life-giving, healing medicine that I wanted to practice. And from that day, I stopped. procedure is what the Supreme Court is debating, second trimester, and people are out there screaming and carrying on. 
about that, demanding the right to do that barbaric procedure. It's barbaric, it's hideous. But they're foaming at the mouth and screaming and carrying on to be allowed to continue a practice like that. This statement is from a women's center. How are second trimester abortion procedures performed to prevent the delivery of a viable pregnancy? Which I did watch a couple interviews of people who were aborted live and saved. One of them was under two pounds and they grew up to be adults. One of them found her birth mother. But this is to prevent a live birth. For women who are found to be 21 weeks or greater, fetal intracardiac injection, intrafetal injection or amnio infusion should be performed to stop the fetal heart immediately within or with immediately within 24 hours or less or less. This statement is coming from a women's center. This is a recommendation. Digoxin, potassium chloride, which as you know is table salt, 1% lidocaine hypertonic saline, and uh, injection of air into the fetal heart are all methods utilized to cause fetal demise within the intrauterine uterine cavity. Those are, those are cleaned up words to say to to um, uh, to cause death of a child in the uterus. This alleviates, listen to this now, the potential stress of patients, their families, and the medical staff of being confronted with the remote possibility of delivery of a live birth. So what is abortion? In a word, it's murder. It's the removal and sometimes dismemberment of unborn children. I have three examples here, and these are from former abortion providers. And there are many such stories. You can find them on the internet. That's where I found them. And these are only excerpts uh, from the entire story in, in, the, in the interest of saving time here. But this one here says, my 23rd abortion changed my mind about doing abortions forever. This patient was a little overweight and ultimately proved to be a little farther along than anticipated. This was not an uncommon mistake before ultrasound was readily available to confirm the gestational age. Initially, the abortion proceeded normally. The water broke, but then nothing more would come out. When I withdrew the curette, I saw that it was plugged up with the leg of the baby which had been torn off. 21 weeks. I then changed techniques and used ring forceps to dismember, oh it's a 13 or 14 week, to dismember the 13 or 14 week size body. As was described in that video. Inside the remains of the rib cage, I found a tiny beating heart. I was finally able to remove the head and look squarely into the face of a human being. A human being that I had just killed. That provider doesn't do abortions anymore. Here's a second one. A patient came to me for complications from a late-term abortion. She said she was kept in a cold room overnight without a blanket during a induction abortion. She was forced to give birth in a toilet the next morning only to watch her still living baby to drown. Third one. This wasn't a physician, but a worker in there. I worked in the cleanup room. In my opinion, the worst part of the clinic because it was so messy. 
You had to wear rubber gloves and it was like washing dishes. That's where the babies were brought back. At the time I worked there, they only did first trimester, trimester abortions. They didn't have facilities to do second trimester. But oftentimes, second trimester abortions were performed and these babies would not be put in the little jar with a label to send off to the pathology lab. We would put them down a flushing toilet. They had a toilet that was mounted to the wall and it was constantly flushing toilet. It, it didn't have a lid or a handle. That's where we would put these babies. They knew that they couldn't turn them in or they were going to be found out that they were doing abortions which were too late term. That is what I participated in while I worked there. The ones that were small enough, which would be 12 to 13 weeks or less, we would put in a jar, label them, put them in a big box to go off to the pathology lab. I want to share this with you, that this is the type of person that I was. As far as moral convictions, I might have had them when I was earlier in my life, maybe 17 or 18. But here I was 21 years old and very much into the world. I did drugs, I drank. I was just a very, very bad sinner. When the babies would be put in the jars, we would hold them up and kind of twirl them around and look at the little arm and the little leg float up. And we'd put them back in the box. As sick as that sounds, that's the way it was and that's the way it is at a lot of places right now. Now this is from Abby Johnson, who worked for Planned Parenthood for eight years. And Abby Johnson now has a ministry to get people away from providing abortions. And this is what she says. Several of our former abortion workers decided to quit their jobs after spending a lot of their time in the recovery room where women were placed after their abortions. They all had similar stories. Women were always crying, bleeding, had blank stares, some immediately voicing their regret. They looked like completely different women than the ones who had walked into the clinic. Abby Johnson now has a ministry. Through my ministry, which is called And Then There Were None, meaning none that would be willing to do abortions, and then there were none, almost 600 abortion workers have left the industry. Praise God for that. And nearly every one of them went into those clinics with the intent of wanting to help women. A noble goal. So this doctor was helped by Abby Johnson's ministry. And he, and, and this doctor says, um, I don't know if this was a man or a woman, this doctor here, but no, it, it was a man. Um, Life changed for me during a 16 to 17 week abortion. I was performing a D&E procedure and had already pulled off both legs of this small human. Every once in a while, you begin to pull out the fetus and the majority of the body will come out intact. I began to pull out the torso and the rest of the body came out whole. The arms, head, and torso were all still attached. I was moving the body, uh, the, yeah, the, the body for, the, to the tray for disposal and a slight movement caught my eye. I looked at this tiny chest and saw it moving up and down. Life was outside that woman's body, even just for a few seconds. And there I was, holding this tiny body. An overwhelming remorse flooded my body. I had violently removed this child's legs while she was still alive. I did that. She felt it. I was the last person to hold her alive. Yet I was the, the person who ended her life. In that moment, I was thankful that she didn't have the ability to open her eyes. I wouldn't have wanted my face to be the first one she would have seen. Now I hope that the first face she saw was the face of Jesus. Why do they do it? Why is abortion done? Well, 
don't, when young girls don't want their parents to know that they got pregnant, get rid of it. No one will know. God knows. Socioeconomic reasons. I can't afford to have a child right now. I can barely support myself. I have too many kids. Get rid of it. Convenience. If I have to take care of this baby, I can't finish my degree. Or I won't be able to advance my career. I don't think that a man will be interested in a woman with a baby. So get rid of it. Some unborn babies are shown to be defective. Down syndrome can be detected through the amniotic, the amniocentesis. I found out the baby has Down syndrome or some other defect. I don't want to face the stigma of having a defective child, so get rid of it. Since Roe v. Wade, there have been 63 million unborn babies murdered in this country alone. And you can never say exactly how many because there's a, an abortion clock and that keeps going up every minute. That's just in this country. They were executed in the most gruesome way. They were innocent. They didn't deserve to be torn apart. They didn't deserve to be flushed on a continuing, continuing flushing toilet. We don't even treat criminals that way. We don't tear murderers apart. Capital punishment is okay for unborn babies. Because they're inconvenient. Too inconvenient to be allowed to live. For the crime of inconvenience, they are executed in a most gruesome way. These innocents are screaming in pain, having their limbs torn off, but they cannot cry because their little lungs and vocal cords aren't developed. It's a silent cry, a silent scream of pain. Abortion on demand is only one of the evils in the times we're living in. Only one of the evils. Just a sign that people are so far away from God. But they're almost foaming at the mouth. They're vociferous. They're oh, vehement. Those who favor abortion. Their hair's on fire at the slightest political move towards limiting abortion in any way. They don't want only, they don't want any, not even one limit on abortion at all. I don't know if partial birth abortion is being practiced anywhere currently, but that is clearly murder. Delivering the whole baby except its head, then sucking its brains out. And that's a fully formed baby. Why is this one issue such a big issue for all these people? There were demonstrations outside the Supreme Court on both sides. The abortion workers that I cited that wrote those stories, they got saved. They turned to God and it changed their lives. They couldn't participate in the evil of abortion anymore. They saw the horror of it in their own hands. God is the giver of life, my friends. How dare we execute the life that he has given? How dare we? Some people argue that we shouldn't execute murderers. The same people <laughs> will argue for the execution of innocent babies. It's an arrogant point of view that man can make decisions about life. Those who do that are trying to take the place of God. I believe that we're allowed to take life that is threatening us, threatening our life, fighting in a just war. I believe we have a right to defend ourselves and our family. There's a debate about when life begins, heartbeat, nerve reactions. 
I believe when those cells come together and start to divide, that there is life. As Christians, we must base our life and our, and our faith on God's Word. When God created Adam, the man was not alive until God breathed life into him. That's where God, that's where life, human life came from. <laughs> Genesis 2, 7, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. He was not alive until God breathed life into him. There were no life functions going on in his body. No cell division, no heartbeat, no brain waves until God put the life into him. At conception, cell division starts to take place. There's motion, there's life, there's life. The miracle of God. We must respect human life as we respect God, the giver of life. We see some politicians in high places who claim to pray. They claim that they pray. They claim to be religious. And they're vehemently opposed to any limitation to abortion on demand, which means they are in favor of this barbaric procedure. So I declare to you as one who carries the gospel that you cannot support such evil and claim to be a Christian. Life is God's business. Job 33, for the Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. Psalm 139, 16, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God has a plan for every person that he creates. Even before they are born, God has a plan. Abortion is man rising up against God. Abortion is deciding what only God can decide. Abortion is eliminating a life that God has given and that God has a plan for. God had a plan for the 63 million babies that were executed in this country alone. Christians must not support anyone who condones or supports such things. In the Old Testament, the Israelites were, were influenced by the nations around them. They were warned by God not to do that. God warned them not to have anything to do with them because of their religious practices. They were sacrificing live infants, being burned alive to demons. I call them demons. They, what they were calling gods, Chemosh, Baal, and Molech. They were all... They were burning live infants in worship to those demons. Is abortion sacrificing the gift of God, which is children, on the altar of convenience? It seems that it is. And is that demon still around who was represented by those hideous caricatures? Is that demon still around? I think that demon is still around. How did the demons convince people to murder their infant children? How did those demons convince? Did they appeal to some logic? We'll give you this child in the fire and you will bless our fields. Today abortion makes sense to those who don't consider God as the author and finisher of life. Those who agree with such things are on the wrong side of God. Abortion is a sin. Agreeing with abortion is sinful. Those who support people in high office, who support abortion, are on the wrong side of God. I should have heard an amen right there. The unborn babies don't cry. We should cry out for them. 
We need to make the elimination of, of abortion a matter of prayer. Pray against abortion. Pray against elected officials who keep abortion legal. Pray against them. Pray against Planned Parenthood. It's an evil organization. Margaret Sanger, who founded Planned Parenthood, was a racist, and her idea was to eliminate the black race by putting abortion clinics near black neighborhoods. That is the truth. Margaret Sanger, look it up if you don't believe me. Pray against that evil organization. Pray for senators and representatives who oppose abortion. Pray for them. Pray that God will cause a change of heart in those advocates for abortion. Pray that young women will turn to God instead of abortion. Be careful to vote for candidates who oppose abortion. The babies don't cry. We should cry out for them. It's a silent cry. You can't tell me that having your legs and arms ripped off doesn't cause a silent cry. Some people just look the other way and pretend it isn't so. Cry out against this evil practice, my friends. Be the voice for the unborn. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. This country will come under judgment because of this evil practice and others. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Vengeance of God is coming. Meanwhile, praying believers need to pray out against this practice and for the people to be converted who are doing this and who are supporting it. Be the voice for the unborn. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Lord, as we as believers in this house, Lord, Most of us are aware of this evil practice and, and how common it is and how prevalent it is and how horrible it is. If we didn't know before, we know now. We pray for the Supreme Court and all the members of it that will not succumb, Lord, to any kind of threats or political pressure. We pray for those who support abortion, to have a change of heart, to hear the gospel and realize that they are advocating for executing unborn children, sometimes in the most gruesome and horrible way. We pray for you to remind them that this life comes from God. We pray for all the people and organizations who are on the life side, Lord. We pray that you will support them, Lord, and that you will encourage them. And we pray, Lord, for the, for the godly decision to come from the Supreme Court and for more states, Lord, to get bolder against this evil practice. Thank you, Lord, for this house of believers. And we pray your blessings again on the ones that are not here today. I know, Lord, this has been a, a tough subject and I have never preached it before. But I pray that the subject of it will fall on ears that have, that maybe somehow on ears, maybe on, maybe on our website, who need to hear this, Lord, to change their minds. And only you can change a heart, Lord, like you did for me and from all these believers in here. We pray for a change of heart on this subject of abortion. And we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, my friends. I